is to come he's the god who was and is and is to come the god who was and is and is to come he's the god who was and is and is to come he's the god who was and is and is to come he's the god who was and is and is to come he's the god who was and is and is to come he's the god who was and is and is to come he's the god who was and is and is to come we sing holy holy is the lord and god almighty we sing holy holy is the lord and god almighty we sing holy holy is the lord and god almighty holy holy is the lord and god almighty to the god who was in days and days to come he is the god who was
Jesus and I pledge my allegiance to the Lamb and I pledge my allegiance to Jesus to Jesus and I pledge my allegiance to the Lamb and I pledge my allegiance
generation grow up without the knowledge of divine things which may contain the germ of national revival in years to come in this time of as we just just obsess and just looking at the face of our king we want to just show a video of haslam that michael marcel has done and we want to look back at what god has done and let that become a prophecy for our now so god can do much more in the days to come and also we want to just honor michael marcel for taking this this god vision that he's he's stewarding in the best way possible so really want to honor michael marcel at this time if we can just put our hands together for the mission that he is stewarding in the best way possible and we'll have the video in a in a few moments
this forgotten hero, once properly saved, brought about revival just about wherever he went. Oh God, I wish I could do that. I wish those people watching this could do that. Bring revival wherever we go, Lord. His name, William Haslam. Haslam was born in Sumatra in 1818 and he went to Durham University and then was going to be ordained and was going to be married. But unfortunately, he received a, a telegram telling him that his fiancée was dying. And he was so grieved by this that he got really ill and he got an infection of the lung and nearly died. But on recovering, uh, he got ordained. And even though in those days he was more about ordinance and rites than he was about the Bible and Jesus, he went to a parish in Cornwall on the instructions of his doctor so that uh, he could recover his health. He was in that parish for five years and then he was moved nearby here to Baldu. There was no church here and there was no vicarage and so he designed and built both and this is the vicarage where we're at today. So he settled here to teach more about morality than salvation. And he would read out his sermons. He never prepared a sermon of his own. He always read out other people's. He wanted to do good for the people because he loved them, but he didn't know how. And then he heard that his gardener had got saved. And this really upset him because he thought he was being deceived. And then in 1851, his gardener got very sick. So Haslam paid him a visit to, to comfort him, but to tell him that he was deceived about being saved. Uh, not exactly what you want to hear when you're lying on your bed. But the gardener's response to him was, but parson, you're not saved. And this really upset Haslam. So he was fortunate. He had nearby um, a, another revivalist, Robert Aitken. And so he went to see him to tell him all his woes and to hopefully receive comfort. But Aitken told him the same thing the gardener did. Haslam, you're not saved. Aitken spoke to Haslam for several hours about Holy Spirit and as a result Haslam had a very restless night and in fact the next three days he was wrestling with the whole subject of salvation. That Sunday he was going to come to his church here and close it down until he had found salvation and he stood up and was just giving out a notice about uh, the, the, the day's reading. And he was then going to close the service, but he felt uh, a light come into him, and he felt joy, and he found salvation. And a, a man, a visiting preacher, who was in the congregation of three or four hundred in this church, stood up, and shouted, the parsons converted, the parsons converted. And everybody got up and shouted and screamed. And when the whole melee had died down, 20 people were crying out to Jesus for mercy. Revival had arrived and would remain for the next three years. The next day, a, a, a neighboring vicar came to try and persuade Haslam out of his madness. And when he realized he wasn't getting anywhere with him, he turned to go and he said he would oppose him in every way he could. And he said, let God stop the man who's wrong. And that 
I think a week later, two weeks later, he had a, uh, a vessel burst in his neck and he was unable to preach again. There was a lot of opposition to Haslam from mainly the clergy and uh, the local gentry. And so he wasn't allowed to preach in other churches. In fact, the vicars would speak against him and warn their people not to attend his services. So he was made to preach outside, uh, like John Wesley did. And he had thousands coming to hear him preach. And he brought revival to, to, to several areas. With the coming revival, there are going to be ministers who are going to oppose it, and we must be prepared for that. For all his successes, Haslam wasn't happy because he found so many of the people who had given their lives to Jesus fell back into their old ways. And so he prayed and he cried out to God asking for the answer. And he then realised that it was about sanctification. And as he sought God, he had an encounter with him, which I believe was the baptism of fire. And he received sanctification and got a revelation of it, which he began to preach wherever he went. In 1857, Haslam moved from here to Hale in Cornwall. This parish was a rough one, and Hale was spiritually dead. But, as usual, through his ministry, revival came. And after he'd been there a while, he walked down one of the main streets, and he saw lights on everywhere with sounds of people praising God or praying uh, coming from each of the houses. Quite a change. At the end of his three-year contract, the whole neighbourhood was alive. But the rector would not renew his contract because he didn't want revival. And he said to Haslam, these new converts are not churchmen. So Haslam then went to Bath and started an inner-city evangelistic work. And it was hard work for him. And his health uh, played up again. He, he was never completely well after his original illness. Um, so he went on a couple of holidays. But if he expected rest, he was not going to get it, because wherever he went, there was revival. Three years later, in 1862, he came here to two parishes with just 25 houses between them. Here in Hassingham and half a mile away, Buckingham. And he arrived here and he said to the Lord, Lord, how can you use me here? And the first Sunday, revival began. And it went on for the eight years that he was here. Again, he had opposition from the clergy. And, their, and particularly their wives. And then when his wife started to preach, the opposition became even stronger. And he had a letter from one of the, the, the wives, uh, uh, one of the clergy wives, that said, I've been praying for years for revival to come here, but if this is what it looks like, I can't thank God for it. From here, he went to London to the well-known Curzon Street Chapel. And he was there for a few years, and then he went and became an itinerant minister. But all the time, revival was at the center of what he was doing. William Haslam died in 1905 at the age of 86. Haslam was a revivalist down to his boots. He persevered despite constant opposition from the church. And we must learn from that. We must also learn that if our leaders are against revival, we must follow Holy Spirit and be involved in any move of God that comes our way.
myself stand. <laughs> Not. Hallelujah. Jesus. Oh, Jesus, we worship you. Come on, lift up your voices and start praising him. King Jesus, we honor you, we glorify you. Hallelujah. Holy, holy, worthy, worthy, worthy. Glory, glory, glory to the highest. Glory in the highest. Glory, ba 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 Sing with me how great is our God, and all will see.
all around you I know there are lightnings and thunderings I know there's a storm all around you Holy, holy Come and reign over here, Lord. Lord, we are so hungry to see you reign in Ilford. Reign in Redbridge, Lord. Let your fire fall. Break out, oh Lord God. Lord, we pray for the spirit of infirmity even tonight to be broken. Jesus, send your fire into every church into every ministry Lord shake it
feel my spirit even tonight. Holy Spirit wants to touch people with encounters. Every meeting is just an opportunity to have an encounter. where we meet Jesus where we fall in love with him I don't want to be in another meeting without having an encounter even tonight come and meet us Lord we want to fall in love with you Jesus
Father, even tonight. I love Jesus. I love, uh, I love revival. I love the fire of God. I love the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I love everything. But you know what? I, I don't believe in giving. I don't believe in. For me, that's that's not revival for me. That's me personally. I may be wrong, but because the reason is this: I'm going to quickly share a testimony, and and that's because of what the Lord did for us. And I do believe the Lord is reminding us, even in this season, if He did it once, He will do it again. If He did it for somebody, He will do it again for another person. So He's the same God, because the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. And I do believe that we, as a church, in this season, when I'm talking about revival, contending for revival, but this is a big part of revival. You know, I don't believe that we can have revival without getting, without having a giving heart. You know, so for me in this season, you know, personally, I've come to a place where I'm just saying, Lord, how can I give more? How can I get to start sowing seeds of uh, the heart of giving? You know, so for us, we started from a small town in India. When I came to Jesus, I did not have even hundred pounds. Got radically saved. Got radically baptized in the Holy Spirit. So just spent time praying. My business had failed. My family's business had failed. Didn't have anyone to go to. All I had was Jesus. I didn't even have anybody I knew. You know, that too, in a small town in India. And I remember after the first encounter, the first thing the Holy Spirit spoke to me was about giving. And people may think it's crazy. I said, Lord, I'll do whatever you say, Lord. For me, at that time, my debt was, I think in, in today's terms, it's like 7,000 pounds. But if you're earning 100 pounds, 7,000 pounds is like a huge mountain, isn't it? And that too in India. You're talking about not, not, in, uh, not in UK or Europe or US, but in India, you know. Like one pound is 90 rupees, 90 something rupees. You're talking about, that's a lot of money. So you're talking, you need to understand, it's not like, it's so 9,000 pounds over here is maybe maybe a lot, but that it's like 90,000 pounds. You know, you understand the context. So you're earning 100 pounds, and you, I mean, so what I'm trying to say is, I'm just talking about Jesus. This is some 20 something years back. And we first got that breakthrough, I remember getting that breakthrough where the Lord told me to sell the business. Someone came miraculously, but we've seen breakthroughs one after the other. One thing I'll tell you, if he did it once, he'll do it again. If the Lord gave you a hundred pounds, then he'll give you your thousand, then he'll give ten thousand, then he'll give you a hundred thousand. So when we came to England, we came in 2005 and we came to start a company. So when we came to start a company, I had to invest 30,000 pounds. So when, when you don't have money, 30,000 pounds again is a lot of money. 
So I remember my boss telling me, I don't want you to leave. So the only way I know that you won't leave is that you put in your money. So if you put in your money, I know you're not going to leave. So he gave me 10% shares. But by the reason he gave that was because he didn't want me to leave the company. So he said, there's the best way. So I know that, you know, you'll stay. So you take 30,000 pounds. So I had to go everywhere searching for 30,000 pounds, which was a lot of money for me. And um, some of the six months I managed it and I paid and 30,000 pounds came in. And we were serving God. We just wanted to, I remember I, I would get salary and we were coming from the Middle East where we didn't have to pay taxes. So we had a lot of cash with us, you know, you know getting a salary. But here you're getting a salary, you had to pay the debt back, you had to pay taxes, you had to pay mortgage and you, then you end up and what, but we started sewing. We would spend like, I think, 10, 20, 20% 20 of our salary. We started giving, you know, to build because God spoke to us about building in East London, revival in East London. I remember we would hire halls and, and no one would be there in the hall. We would spend 600 pounds, 800 pounds a month just on hiring halls and putting out chairs and two people, five people would turn up. This was happened for two years. And, but we were just sewing every month, month after month, month after month. You know, I remember, you know, just saying like, you know, people think that you're crazy. Not seeing anything, you're not seeing people say, you're not seeing people, uh, you know, not happening, but you're just putting six or eight hundred pounds and crazy. And I remember one pastor came and told me, he said, um, Guys, you know what? Are you crazy? You have a hall of 15 people you've taken prime, and, uh, and you have a 300 seat hall you've taken, you have 10 people coming. Can you give us that hall? We have at least have 200 people. So I said, I, I mean, I remember, I mean, I got so thing. I said, this is about a vision. This is about what God's told. You know, it's not about the number of people, you know. But what I'm trying to say is it was faith. It's just believe that every child be full. And every, we believe that God's going to move. And, but we saw it, didn't see it happen. We just believed it. And faith. And what I'm trying to say is, I love this verse in Joel. You know, one for it says, what the cantima worm is stolen, what the panther worm is stolen. You know, and then all the worms stole. And Joel 2 says, that comes a time of restoration. You keep putting in and you keep putting in and you keep putting in. There comes a time of restoration. I mean, I'm not a prophet, like listen, but I get, I was telling Tony, I get certain times when I, I get dreams, what can be once in a year, once in two years, and those are like crazy dreams. But when I get it, I get it, you know. So it, it happened, I had a dream. In that dream, all the companies were going into bankruptcy and administration. And the Lord said, now you're going to prosper in this time of administration. This is just before the recession started happening. And I didn't understand anything. I didn't know what this was all about in, in terms of that because... And um, so almost two or three years we had been sowing and like, you know, having no money and we just barely meeting everything. And, and we had even so been sowing in cars and just sowing. Everything has been sowing. And, and no fruit even in the, you know, in, in terms of, um, you know, in, in terms of ministry, not much fruit even in terms of business, you know. So everything was like three-year season was an ongoing sowing season. And it came after that, uh, I got it, within a month, the company started going into administration. You know, one company after the start started failing, you know, UK went into, uh, went into a big recession, it was like a huge, you know, that fa famine which happened in the time of Isaac, things like that, you know. And Lord said, this season, you're going to see the, the, the children of God are going to prosper. So I we stood on the word that there's going to be a difference. And what happened is, during the end of that, that within six months, the everything crashed, you know, the property prices crashed, uh, Businesses crashed, and at that time, we what we invested thirty thousand, we were able to sell the shares at more than a million pounds. And what house we bought houses which were listed at six thousand, we could buy it at five hundred thousand pounds. In the time of recession, this is just I'm talking about two thousand nine. You know, what I'm trying to say is I'm just saying a story because every time we've seen. Listen, there's a big difference when you operate on faith. You cannot go by your circumstances. You cannot go by how things are. And that is how we started the church in, this, in that season. 
we never you wanted to use finances to build a church out of people coming and say we had money but i would never put in the money because i never wanted the church growing with my money people come and say oh you know what church grew because you guys put in money that's not the truth we never did that we what we did is obviously we sowed we were the biggest givers but we don't want to use money because we want to be it has to be the spirit of the lord coming and moving but you need finances and when the lord comes in and breathes finances you're able to give more so listen what i'm trying to say is quantifiable first it's the thousand then it's a ten thousand it's a million i know the lord was rebuking me in the season he says son you know why i'm not giving certain things break this because i want you to give more so it's not it's not about how much it is because it's the end when we bought the building within a year we bought this at one million pounds because we were a small church why because we knew if god is in it you know god's money money is going to come we soared into revival i was telling tony just before the conference we lost over fifty thousand pounds doing a conference on revival just fifty thousand pounds and that would we never thought within so which means we were fifty thousand short pounds again short to buy the building but you know what on the day just before the thing god bought that a million pounds listen what i'm trying to say is i believe you listen if you're pursuing revival if you're pursuing god god will give finances but when you don't pursue revival when you don't pursue the presence you try to play games and you know, storying about all those things i'll tell you something it doesn't work at least it doesn't work for me but when jesus is in something then he is going to break the pot with the with the with the thing so with i mean i see this time there's going to be a big increase i just feel it in my spirit but more than anything tony i felt so strong even you're here three just this three days this year big financial breakthrough is coming for you but we want to sow a seed to you you know this is a year of big breakthrough for you in finances you know i don't know what you've been going through but we as a church we as a congregation we even people sowing you can sow online we want to sow into his life because you know what when you sow a good seed that's going to you're going to reap and there are seasons times of sowing and i i'll tell you sometimes you know you want to sow into people's lives we want to bless Tony because I'll tell you one thing. When he came in over here, people didn't know him over here because he's coming for the first time. But there's going to come a time people are going to come because, you know, even the last three days, we, we, all our team have been listening to him. He has a word for our generation. Yes. You know, there are people who have word for this generation. He has a word. You know, even we did an interview with him. Everything he speaks is wisdom. And it's, it's not come suddenly. It's come over years, 20, 20. So those years have been, he's been plowing with seeds. Amen. So if the ushers want to pass out the envelopes, you can give in different ways. And, and everything we're sowing today is going to go into Tony's uh, life and ministry. And But it's more than that. It's a seed we're going to sow today. Amen. So I just want to, Rachel, if you can sing that once more. Just feel that sort of revival.
let's all just stand up. Let's honor Tony as he comes to minister.
coração. Jeez. 
Jesus. We bless you, God. We bless you, Jesus. We say, bless the Lord, O oh, my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy.
but there's this invitation of the Lord tonight to come to the table of the Lord, the table of the King, because in that place, He covers you. Do you get what I'm saying? Are you with me? At the table of the King, we laugh at the enemy because He covers all of our weakness. He covers our disability. speak to anybody tonight. Just receive that. I have a feeling you have pretty good stamina. She reminds us of our first worship leader, this breaker, warrior, prophetic, you know. And so I, I feel that it, it's like at some point I hope you meet because it's, it's going to be like twins meeting. You know, it's, it's amazing how similar, you know, just the worlds that we come from, which is worlds apart, but it's the same world, you know. And, and so you can, you can stay there or sit down, you know. Good-looking people standing behind me. You can't go wrong with that, right? And so I'll give you a break. But thank you so much. Can we give the worship team a big God bless you? of you ready to move <laughs> you could stay if you want I, I, I'm not gonna you're gonna go down okay I can stay I didn't know no no you could go down you could go down <laughs> now imagine um, our worship pastor now he He's phenomenal. He plays like 15 instruments professionally. You know, I hate him. <laughs> you know, he's one of those that you just love to hate. You know, for me, I'm still trying to become good at one thing. I, I am good at one thing. It's eating. And so I, I did perfect that one almost. But, I'll, you know, he usually leads on a guitar behind me. And I had him one time ministering, the, you know, just played the instrument behind me the entire service, which is four and a half hours long. And if you're a guitarist, you know, I don't care how long you've been playing, your fingers start falling off, right? And so, anyways, I just, I just love, you know, if all we do is worship, I feel like we do our job. That's, that's what we're created for. That's, that's why we're here, you know? And um, if you have your Bibles, Let's turn to Psalm 102.
Psalm 102, page 517 of your Bible. <laughs> Holy Spirit, we thank you that you're here. Thank you that you're moving amongst us. We ask that the Ruach of God, the breath of God, be released tonight in a fresh way. Give us ears to hear. Holy Spirit, help us to understand the spiritual language. Help these people. Help me. Help all of us, because we need it. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. You know, Psalm 102 is such a profound chapter in the Bible. It's, it's one of those chapters where it's all about the desperate cry of the presence of God. You know, there's a plea that begins with the first verse, and we're going to go on a little journey here and, and break verses 18 to 21 down, or 18 to 20 down really tonight. But just to give you a context of this passage, you know, you see right in verse 1 and 2, it says, Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry for help come to you. It's the cry for his presence. It's the cry for the very nature and essence of our creator God that this psalmist is crying out from a deep place of suffering. Have you ever suffered where you're crying out? Right? And so this is, the, this is where the psalmist is. There's deep affliction that took place. His nation is going down into just, it's, it's spiraling downward. He, he's desperate for solutions. He's desperate for answers. He's now at a breaking point. He's been afflicted in his own body with sickness. So there's, you know, ever, you ever been in a season where you feel like nothing's going right? You know, again, it's the piling on season, right? And so in verse 1 and 2, you know, he's saying, God, I need more of you. And then in verses 3 to 7, he's saying, you know what? He's talking about his health. He's talking about his sickness. And then in verses 8 through 11, he's talking about how the enemies are attacking him. And, and he's going through this process with God. And all of us have this process with God that we're going through, don't we? There's a place in our life where it's, it's the dark place. It's a place that we like to ignore. It's a place that we like to shun and stay away from. It's a place that perhaps we like to be in denial of. And see, but it's in that place. Now think about this. It's in that very place. All of a sudden, as all the psalmists do, there's this turnaround. Say turnaround. And how many of you know we have the God of the turnaround? Yeah. We have a God of the great reversal. Yeah. See, God spoke to me this year and he said, Tony, get ready. Because I don't know about you, but 2016, 17, 18 were not of God. <laughs> it, it was some of the most challenging years for me in a long time. Right? It's one of those, one of those years I'd just like to erase from my history. I'm just glad that I got through it. You know, the fact that I'm here, the fact that you're here is because we won. The fact, I don't care what you're going through. I mean, I care, but it doesn't matter what you're, because the fact that you are here pursuing his presence, you are winning. And see, so you are, you're winning from a place of victory, even though we have to go through this procession, because it, within the procession is the provocation of the Lord. And when there's a provocation of the Lord, that becomes the meeting place face to face. See, if we allow our circumstances to provoke us, it'll rule us. But that which we allow provoke us is what draws us in. And so we're in a season where the provocation of the Lord is going forth, and it's an invitation for us to come to the king's table. But see, my question is, what table are we eating from? Are we eating from a table where we're completely exposed, or are we eating at the king's table where he says, I cover you completely? And so this is where the psalmist is, and all of a sudden, the great reversal. He said, Tony, 2020 is the year of the great reversal. 
And how do I know that? Because I had a dream and I woke up at 8.28 and I thought, what is this? Romans 8.28, for God causes all things together for the good, for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Does anyone love God in this place? I'm talking about you then. Get ready because the turnaround is happening and there's a great reversal that's taking place. And the reason why the great reversal is taking place is because you are having encounters with God in the place of your darkness, in the place of your need, in the place of your sickness. Because how, how do you change the name of your season? How do you change the name of your land? How do you change the name of your history? Is by having encounters with God. Everything begins with encounter. Everything begins with encounter. I need to be done by nine. I have so much to say. So that means that I'll just have to speed up the way I talk. See, I grew up in gangs, dabbling in drugs by the time I was in fifth grade. As I mentioned before, I'm the only Asian I've ever met in a black gang. I was also part of an Asian gang. And I bridged the two communities and we built a powerful business. Street pharmaceutical sales is what my business was. I was a COO, CEO, you want to call it, in other words, in, the, in, 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 in these crews, you call them shot callers. I was a shot caller. And, and, and I grew up in this culture where there was a lot of abuse, a lot of chaos. My father was born in slavery under the Japanese regime in Hiroshima, and he was there when the bomb dropped. He's a Hiroshima bomb survivor. My mom, she was born from North Korea when Korea was one, uh, one nation. In the Korean War, she was migrating south. Her father was killed and her sister was killed. She was one year old. She grew up without a father. So God decides to put these two people together and birth this incredible son. I don't know why you're laughing. I'm really talking about my younger brother. <laughs> I'm the eldest of three children. So my father comes to America. Two years later, brings my mom over. He's settling. And in our history, we have Confucianism. We have, we're Buddhist and Shintoist because of the Japanese and Korean culture. We have a lot of spiritualists in our family who are palm readers over the generations. We have shamanists as well, which is really interesting. And so in this, we used to do a lot of ancestral spirit worship. So we used to go to the cemetery, lay out food, and we would bow down to the spirit and then have them come and eat the food and we would take the food and go away. There was one problem. Every time they summoned them and they said that they came and eat, there was no food missing. And I'm not a type of, I'm not the typical Asian where I'm, I speak when I'm spoken to. I speak when I'm not supposed to speak. And so while they're doing their, you know, whatever, whatever they do, right? I was eating the food. <laughs> and let me tell you something. Once a foodie, you're always a foodie. <laughs> and so they say, don't do that. And I ask questions. You're crazy. I tell my family this. You're nuts. And you say this in an Asian culture, you get the backhand. Yeah. You know, which I did, many of them. I've, I've known a lot of backhands. And, and so, so I'm going through this. My mom gets terminally sick. There's a, there's a disease she gets that the doctors can't figure out. Her, out of her friend calls her and says, hey, you got to come to church with me. This is your only answer. Out of total desperation, she takes my brother and I to this place called church, and people are wild. I mean, it's a lot of screaming and shouting. Have you ever heard Koreans pray? <laughs> you know, so Koreans pray, you know, if you ever, but then Koreans who pray during revival, yeah. it's like another, it's like injecting them with steroids, <laughs> Right? And so this place was wild. It was lit. It was on fire. And I'm looking around going, this place is crazy. I'm about five years old. Maybe four. Maybe three. Maybe two. <laughs> and so, so then all the, you know, the things happen. And then uh, the minister, he goes, on the right-hand side, I see this woman. And you have this disease. And da, 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 da. The fire of God hits my mom. She's instantly healed. She gives her life to Jesus. Becomes first Christian in our family lineage, he, she, brings, she brings us up and this minister prays for her and me and all these things and under the ministry of Dr. Yungi Cho, she gets saved. 
See, and so we come back. All of a sudden, she starts taking us to this place called church. I hated church. It's the last place I wanted to be. Fast forward to seventh grade. It's the grade that I knew everything. And I said, I'm done with church. God is fake. You're crazy, mom. Da, 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 da. I'm angry. I'm running the streets and doing all these things. And my mom knows my heart. And she says, hey, you know what? Why don't you go to church each week? I'll pay you to go to church. It's my second business. She paid me $3 a week to go to church. Plus, she gave me bonuses. Which she called it a tithe. I called it a bonus, a tip. And, and she would give me money, and I went to church. I was almost a junior high dropout. The miracle was I graduated eighth grade. I was known as a dumb one of the family, you know, and I could go on and on, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> For graduating eighth grade, I get a gift. My mom says, you know, I'm sending you to youth camp. I'm like, a gift? Youth camp? It's a curse, not a gift. What are you doing? Woman! She says, well, I paid. You're going to go. So we get on, we jump on to uh, the bus, and we head out. It's about 100-something junior hires, and we get to a place called Prayer Mountain. Don't woo me. And, and we get there, and all of a sudden, I realize they're passing out the booklets, orientation, you know, what's going to happen over the next four days. And all of a sudden, it's fasting and prayer for four days. Junior hires, 10 to 13 year olds. We used to call that spirituality back then, but now we call that spiritual abuse. And then we wonder why our culture is the way it is today. You know how in trouble I got when I was radical in the youth pastor? Parents used to call and yell at me. I eventually got fired. It's okay though, I got inner healing. Don't feel too bad. But we get there, I look at the schedule, get up at 5 in the morning, you pray from 5 to 7, you get ready for 30 minutes, and then you go to the kitchen, drink the breakfast, it's water. And then you have morning service, you have group time, you go to the uh, kitchen again, you drink your lunch, and then after, after lunch you have free time, and, that, and during the free time, I'm like, at least we got three hours of free time. But no, it wasn't free time, it was free time according to Korean definition, which means you could pray wherever you want on the prayer mountain for three hours. And then you come back, and then you get into group time, and then you wash up, and then you go to the kitchen, and you drink your dinner, and then we have service and then we before we go to bed we pray for two and a half hours that's our regimen for four days how many of you could do that now as fiery believers I can't even do that now that was three nights we had to do that and so the first night I'm emaciated I'm going to you know I'm starving people are getting baptized in the spirit people are getting whacked by God and all these things and and people are like Tony are you I are, you know did you get hit with the spirits are you speaking in tongues yet and I'm like well my stomach's speaking something <laughs> Yeah, it's like, you know, so that night I just go to bed. I wake up with a nightmare. I had night torments all my life growing up. I wake up with scratches on my body, places where I couldn't reach. I, I mean, it was just, um, it, was, uh, it was a very dark place, a very dark time. And I woke up with a nightmare. I went to my youth pastor. I said, hey, I had a nightmare. And he goes, what, were the demons chasing you? What was that? I said, no, I was preaching. He goes, what? He goes, I knew you were called. And I, I, was, I got angry when he said that. He walked away smiling, and I was there mad. Second day comes around. Second night, and I said, okay, God, if you're real, I dare you to give me another dream. And so I went to bed, had a dream. In the dream, this, um, you know, I was, I was just, there was a sea of people. I was preaching the gospel. People were walking out of wheelchairs. They're throwing up crutches. People were responding to the gospel. People were getting saved, and I woke up, and I thought, No! I wanted to be a professional athlete. I was, I was actually a pretty good athlete growing up. And I was being trained for the 92 Olympics. You know, some of you are like, what, in Taekwondo? Don't be racist. <laughs> but yes, it was. It was in Taekwondo. And so, so, you know, so my heart was, my heart was to be a professional athlete. I just wanted to be rich. I didn't care about fame. I just wanted to be rich. Right? And I figured the way I'm living, I would die by the time I'm age mid-20s or so. And I wanted to go the way I was going to go. Right? And so, so you know, so I'm, I'm thinking this is the worst nightmare I could ever have. Worse than a drive-by getting shot, getting, you know, stabbed. Getting, I'm like, might as well just kill me now. And I looked at my youth pastor. I said, I had another dream. He said, Tony, you're called. I said, I don't want to own a car like yours. It doesn't even run. We have to push it down a hill for you to pop the clutch to make that thing go. 
I said, you live in a house so small, I put it in my pocket. I said, like, I don't want to live like you. You're poor. And I said that to him. How, would you, how many of you would love a child like this? Right? <laughs> love the pastor a child like this. And so he said, Tony, you're called. So then that afternoon, I'm, the dreams were haunting me. God was haunting me. And in that free time, I finally went to one of the prayer cells. And I said, okay, God, if you're real, which you're not, because I am God. You know, I really did think I was God. I was an atheist. I wasn't an atheist because I believed I was God, right? And so there was a time when my church asked me to pray publicly. I prayed, and this is what I said. In the name of Tony Kim, I pray. Amen. Walked off the stage stand, and everyone looked at me like the way you're looking at me now. <laughs> That's, that was me. I, I didn't believe in a God, and I wasn't going to. But I had a con I said, okay, God, I memorized your scriptures, and I memorized a lot of scriptures because it was a Bible-believing, solid church that really didn't understand the move of the Spirit. It was taking place during that camp. And, and I said, I read your Bible, heard messages, all boring, haven't seen anything. I said, you're not real because I, I laid out, I went through this, this abuse, that abuse, why all of this, all, you know, I just started questioning God. And I said, you know what, I dare you. I dare you, I dare you, God. If you're real and you say you're that all-powerful God, I don't want to hear about you, I don't want to talk about you, I don't want to read about you, I want to see you. And moments after, that's when everything changed. He walked into the room. Everything, just imagine these walls and the lights and the stage melting like wax. And there is a bright light, the sil sil silhouette figure of a man on fire. The whole atmosphere was misty, and he was walking towards me. And I realized this. I, don't, I didn't know what was going on. I was in a different dimension, not in a mind's eye vision, literal body form. I would look around and there was nothing there and I knew that God was real. I fell on my face and this was my first thought. He's going to kill me. <laughs> because the, the faith that we grew up with was very works-based. Come to church early, help set up everything, stay late, tear down everything, and then you go to a prayer meeting and how many of you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And so I thought, if I was God, I would kill me because of the way I acted, what I did, and things. And so I just, and I just thought literally to myself at 13 years old, my life is over. But as he got closer, I never felt the love like that before. My anger, the chaos inside of me just dissipated. I looked up. He was speaking spirit to spirit without using words he was communicating. I got up, looked into his eyes, and he just said, follow me. See, when he steps into your situation, everything changes. It all starts with encounter. See, in Genesis 28, starting with verse 10, it talks about how Jacob, he was going from one place to another, and then he laid down to go to sleep. It says he put his head on a rock and he went to bed and he had a dream. We know what it is. In the dream, the heavens were opened and there was a ladder that came down and angels began ascending and descending. Now isn't it interesting, the language that Genesis uses in terms of sequence of the words, ascending and descending, that means that angels were already there. They were already on the land. And there was something about Jacob where he, was, he had a dream and he saw that. He wakes up and this is what he says, God is in this place and I didn't even know it. See, some of you, you're in a place and God is there, but you don't even know it. And then he says, he has this encounter with God in the dream, wakes up, say encounter, and he wakes up and he says this. He says, I'm naming this place Bethel, the house of God. 
that city, Luz, was famous for its nuts. They're almonds. There's a lot of nuts a lot of places, isn't there? But this is what he says. He says, I'm calling this place Bethel. See, uh, encounters give you authority to change names over cities. See, encounters give you power and authority to change the reputation of your family, to change the name of your household from unsaved to saved, from bondage to delivered, from sick to healed. See, this is, everything starts with encounter. Are you with me? And the greatest way we encounter God is by worship. Through our praise. So no matter what the enemy throws at us, get, let him take your money. Let him take your health. Don't let him take your praise. Because once he takes your praise, he took everything. The enemy is really not after your money. He's not after your health. He's not after your mindset. You know what he's after? He's after your intimacy. The attack is always on the intimacy. But he uses circumstances to detract you and to derail you from your intimacy with God. And so Psalm 102, this is where this man is. He's in that place. And in verse 12, all of a sudden he says, but you, O God. And he starts recognizing the majesty and the awe of God. And he steps into the fear of God. And he starts adoring God. How many of you know, adoration unlocks the revelation of God. You want greater revelation? Start adoring God. We need the art of adoration to come back into the church today. We need to learn and we need to teach God's people how to adore God once again. And see, and then in verses 13 to 14, all of a sudden he starts talking about the favor of God. All this is happening, but God, you're a God who gives favor. How many of you have been asking God for favor? Anybody? You better be careful what you ask for because the last two years, favor almost killed me. Favor could be your friend or your greatest foe. Because I began to serve favor. Instead of letting favor serve me. It's a different message. And then verses 15 to 17, he recognizes again the greatness of God. How great is our God. And he's, just, he's, he's recognizing again his majesty on the throne. And then we get to verse 18. This will be written for a generation to come that a people not yet created may praise the Lord. Say, not yet created. created. See, as he's adoring and looking and just seeing God from the place of majesty, you want a glimpse of your future? Get a revelation of his majesty. Start adoring God, and he'll show you the future. All of a sudden, he steps into a realm where he says, I'm going to write something to a people who don't even exist yet. These people aren't even created yet. And this is a prophetic word for you and I today where he says, this is written for us. Let this be written to a generation not yet created that they may praise the Lord. That they may praise the Lord. How many of you know that praise is your weapon? We sing it. This is how we fight our battles. It's, it's through our praise. Isn't it interesting in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 where Jehoshaphat, King Jehoshaphat, they're all surrounded by their enemies. He says, assemble the troops. Get the warriors. We're going to go to war. He gets the word of the Lord. And what happens? They come before the enemy, lifting their hands, their banners. I think they were charismatic. They're shofars, they come out lifting their hand, and the enemy says, we got them. But what were they doing? They weren't singing songs of warfare. They weren't going after the principalities. They began to sing love songs to Jesus. They began to sing about him and to him. Where they thought they're walking out in surrender, 
They didn't know that they were lifting their hands under submission and praise to the Lord. Your name is like honey on my lips. Your spirit's like water to my soul. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. Jesus, I love you. I love you. 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 I love you. Jesus, I love you. I love you. I love you. Jesus, I love you. I love you. I love you. Jesus, I love you. I love you. And the Lord fought their battle. A people not yet created. A new creation. We could talk about that. But why did he create us for this purpose? Verse 19, for he looked down from his holy height, from heaven the Lord gazed upon the earth to hear the groaning of the prisoner, to set free those who are doomed to death. Your intimacy with God is good for you, but we also need to understand our intimacy with God sets the world free. He gave a glimpse of the future to this man who was living in darkness under sackcloth and ashes is what the chapter says because he's mourning. He's in pain. He starts worshiping and praising the one and all of a sudden he gets a glimpse of the future and he says, I'm going to write something down for a people that's not even yet created that they may praise him. Because he looked down from his holy height to hear the groans of the prisoners and to set free those who were doomed to death. Do you understand that when we praise in here, see what we need to do, we, we have to learn to praise a little bigger than the room. See, we have to learn to praise a little bigger than the audience we're with. We have to learn to praise bigger than the instruments and the sounds that come from this place. We need to learn where, 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 where our praise actually covers and becomes a canopy over London, over UK, over Europe. And when we start coming together and we start understanding the power of praise as we go after the presence of the Holy One, going after the presence of the Holy One who makes Himself so tangible to us, we start seeing cities changed. You'll start seeing your families changed. You want your family changed? Let's start complaining and let's start worshiping in our home and start shifting the atmosphere in our home through our praise, through our adoration. I'm telling you, it works. Because, see, our praise created us to praise Him. And what's the byproduct? That those who are doomed to death and those who are in prison are set free and delivered. There's something about praise that we have not stepped into in the revelation of Jesus as we worship with all those around the throne in Revelation 4. And see, and until we learn to worship and praise Him from a place of eternity, we will never reach the natural. And so let's turn to Acts chapter 16 really quick. I'm going to try to speak faster now. Acts chapter 16, verse 22 to 29. For time's sake, I'm just, we're just going to paraphrase this, paraphrase this, and we're all going to, you, you're all familiar with this already. And the crowd rose up together against him, and the chief magistrates tore their robes off and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. You ever feel like life beats you with rods? You ever feel like friends beat you with rods because of Jesus? Don't Google my name. No one knows who I am, but it's funny how people write about me. Apparently, I murdered three people. 
I embezzled ministry funds. I cheated on my wife. And there's a picture of me and my daughter having father-daughter date together on the internet. And so, see, you ever feel like you're being persecuted or there's wrongful accusations that come against you? The apostles did. Welcome to being a witness. I'm not saying being persecuted because the spirit is stupid or self-inflicted persecution and then we all of a sudden like, I'm suffering for Jesus. No. You're suffering because of your consequences. Amen. I still love you. Smile. Some of you, your smile went off. You're like... I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about everyone out there. Right? Because we're good in here. Amen. They were beaten beyond recognition because of preaching the gospel. I go to nations where we're running from place to place, hidden under blankets, and it, it gets exciting at times. You know, it does. It, you know, I, I, I love it. You know, I actually fasted on water for 14 days for the gift of celibacy because I was going to be a martyr either in Pakistan or North Korea. You know, and then I ended up getting married and have three kids and been married for 21 years. And <laughs> so that tells you how that worked. I was so mad after 14 days when I realized, okay, great. I still love women. <laughs> That's a whole nother story. But they were thrown in the inner prison. Say inner prison. See, within the Roman prison system, there are three levels. And they were put in the inner prison. It was the dungeon of all dungeons. It was apart from any communication with any other person. It says that their feet were shackled and they were chained to a wall. They can't be feeling that well. They've just been beaten pretty good. And I could imagine the conversation between Paul and Silas went something like this. Because at this point, Silas was still a prophet. In another place in Acts, he's called an apostle. But here's, an, he's, you know, and so Silas is moaning. Paul says, Silas, how you doing? Silas says, how do you think I'm doing? I'm hurting. How about you, Paul? Well, you know, just thinking. This never happened when I was with Barnabas. <laughs> Prophets cause all kinds of trouble. You know, why can't you be encouraging like Barnabas, Silas? <laughs> You just this conversation. This is where my mind goes. I just kind of, I'm a little sick that way, right? And, and they're having this conversation. All of a sudden, they say, you know what? Paul, as the father, says, Silas, let's pray. They start praying. And I said the other night, our prayer doesn't move God. It moves us into alignment with God. And then together... Heaven and earth moves to manifest the love of God in very tangible ways. And then they start praising. They start lifting up the name of Jesus in their pain. When I was broken in Asia after my head-on collision, the, you know, I shared this with you the other night, all I could do was praise him. That was the only thing that got me through the night. I would weep because of the pain. And just, God, you're good. You're good. You're good. And I would just say that for 10 hours throughout the night. I would fall asleep out of exhaustion and just wake up. God, you're good. There's one like you. You're good. And he starts singing hymns of praise to God. And listen. It says, other prisoners were listening. Their sound was being heard around them. How many of you know we all have a sound and everyone is listening to the sound you're releasing to them? And see, and here they are. They're releasing a sound. It says it was about the midnight hour, and they're singing hymns and praise. They're praying to God, and, and people were listening to it. What sound are people listening to when, they, when they're next to you? What, song, what sound are, are people listening to when they're with you? And see, and so as we're pursuing his presence, there's a different sound because the frequencies and the attunement and reattunement within the frequencies of humanity become the same as divinity. And when the frequencies match and the melody and the harmony and the four parts go into perfect con yeah. 
something happens. <laughs> See, we want to shake the world, but here's the reality. Our little one incident shakes our entire life. See, we need to be grounded. We need to, we need to mature and become like oaks of righteousness where our roots go down deep. So we need to become that Psalm 1 people. See, when God shakes everything that can be shaken, and he is and he does, how many of you know we're part of a kingdom that cannot be shaken? Because our God is a consuming fire. The purpose of the thin place, the purpose of your process, and the purpose of the places of darkness where, where you're living through life is so that the fire refines you. So, so, you, so you start releasing a different sound when people are with you. And if you want to shake the nations, you want to shake your family, you, got, you know what? We have to continue to learn to praise. I got a job. I got a raise. Praise him. You got demoted and you got fired. Praise him. Someone affirms you and gives you a pat on the back. Praise him. Someone slanders you. Praise him. The church grows. Praise him. Everyone leaves. Praise him. That's just called subtracted blessing. Subtracted blessings always happen before additional blessing. And so here they are in that place. And all of a sudden it says that the foundations of the prisoners, the prison house, were shaken. And immediately, say immediately. immediately. See, we need to learn to praise until the immediately comes. And see, so the immediately comes and it says this. And immediately all the doors were open. Don't you love that? See, we want our prison doors to open. I want to pr propose this. Many of you, the prison doors are already open, and God's waiting for you to come out. God, take me out. No, you got legs. Walk out. I opened the door. We want God to do everything for us. And maybe when he doesn't do it for us, it's because he wants to do it with us. And so here, here they are, they're, you know, the chains were unfastened, the doors opened up. But it doesn't say their doors opened up, it says everyone's door opened up. Yeah. See, perhaps when you're going through the valley and going through the wilderness, God allowed you to go that way because there's some people along the way that he wanted you to unlock out of prison. Yeah. Maybe you were to praise your way through and come out with more than when you first stepped in. That's what Jesus did, didn't he? He went to the underbelly of the earth and he came out with more than what he went, went in with and see and so your praise becomes powerful the lord began to speak to me about this and i need to land this plane i got five minutes help me jesus so i started seeing okay jesus you're showing me this i'm a doer i'm a practitioner you know, I, I appreciate theoreticians, but I'm a practitioner. So, and I'm a worshiper and praiser anyway, so I just started practicing. Let's see what happens. And 90% of the time, I'll have worship on and around me and things like that. And, and so I just started, being, I started becoming more intentional in my worship. Because your vertical praise has a horizontal effect. See, and so when we learn to take our vertical praise and our pursuit after him, and all of a sudden we become intentional, becoming aware of his presence, your awareness of him becomes that, that, that point where you release the kingdom. And so a few years ago, I was in Dallas, and I just did a conference, and I was at the airport, and I was just praising him. And the song that I was listening to and I was worshiping to was, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here right and so all of a sudden you know I sit down and I'm at the gate and people are there and you know people are looking up and they're just watching this bird fly around and I'm going okay there's that bird poor bird stuck in the airport that thing flies around and he lands on my shoulder and he starts chirping and I thought this is weird get off my shoulder you know and I'm shaking it and it's sitting on my shoulder and it's chirping and I'm just worshiping and people are looking at me freaking out they're like whoa you know, they said, you know how long that bird's been flying around? I said, no, I just sat down. They said, I've been watching that bird for the last 20 minutes. And I said, wow. You know, and it just sitting on my shoulder. 
And I'm going, and I know I'm in a God moment, but it's like five o'clock in the morning, and there's no moments with God for me at five o'clock in the morning, right? And so I'm like, I'm in a God moment, but I have no clue what's going on. I just want this bird off my shoulder, right? And so it's sitting there, and I thought, this is just really, so I'm really tense sitting there. People are coming up to me. They're talking to me. They're taking selfies with me, taking pictures of me. It's really weird. You know, I became like the celebrity of gate number 13, you know, Tony Kim, gate number 13. And so I'm there, and and I'm just, in about 20 minutes later, it's still on my shoulder. It flies off to about a chair as, as distant to the front row there. You know what it does? It flies off. It does his business on the chair. And it flies back on my shoulder. I'm like, this is a saved bird. This is a Christian bird. Right? And I'm, I'm there. You know, and this older lady next to me, she goes, boy, you're freaking me out. You know, and she's like, who are you? I'm like, my name's Tony Kim, ma'am. Nice to meet you, you know. And, and so then they're calling us. I get this, you know, uh, notification on my phone. First class upgrade. I'm like, that's Jesus. And so that was, I never had an upgrade up to that point. That was the first time I ever got an upgrade. And so they're calling me, and I'm going, okay. And I looked at the bird. This is weird. I looked at the bird out loud. I said, it's time for me to go. It's time for you to go. And the bird flew off. And everyone's watching me. He's the bird man. That's what they said. He's the bird man. And so, so then I get on the plane. I'm on the seat 1A, right? Uh, first apostle. Isn't that what it means prophetically, Simon? You know? <laughs> 1A. <laughs> right. And so... so <laughs> So here we are, and people are walking by, giving me a high five. So they're like, Birdman, 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 right? So I get off the plane, I'm going, I just had an encounter with God. I don't know what it is. And, and so then from there, a few months later, my friend calls me. He says, are you watching the Oscars? You know, the whole, you, you guys know what that is in England. No, I'm just kidding. I was being derogatory. <laughs> and so uh, my friend says, guess what movie just won? I said, what? He goes, Birdman. I was like, What? So then I'm reminded of that again because he reminded me, and then I'm pressing into God that week. One of my prophet friends calls me, and he, had a, he goes, had a dream of you last night. A bird landed on you. It was in Dallas. It was during this time. And he unpacks this entire revelation, and he's talking about the power of praise of the children of God that causes all creation to, to, to come into the glory. It's Habakkuk 2.14. And see, and so I'm like, okay, that's the Lord. How many of you know that you are assigned? That you are assigned and your sound is for the world. So when, when we're fasting and pursuing God in here and we're fixing our eyes on Christ, when we go out there, I'm telling you, something's going to change. Something has to change. Because if what we do in here doesn't work out there, it's just religious activity. It's got to work. And so, so then I, I go, out, I go, okay, great. So then I'm just continuing to worship and praise, and I need to fast forward this into my last story, I think. And so, so then I get a call about midnight one night at my house, and I pick it up, and it says, is this Father Tony? <laughs> sure. <laughs> that was he. <laughs> right? And so, and I go, well, I said, yes. I said, can I help you? And they said, um, you're being summoned for last rites right now. I don't know what that is. I'm Asian. Right? I, I, I don't know what that is. And I, I said, last rites? And my wife looked at me. She grew up Catholic. And she says, that's Catholic. And I'm like, okay. And I said, they're asking me to come and do last rites. Should I go? It's, it's midnight. I have my basketball shorts on, t-shirt. I have my hat on backwards. You know, my priestly garment. Right? <laughs> And so, so here I am, I'm in that, and my wife goes, just go, right? And I said, yes, where are you? Da, 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 da. Oh, I'm on my way. Did I change? No. I am a new breed father. I am a new generation of priests, right? So I go there, and I walk in, and, you know, it's, I think I'm really cool, right? I have my basketball shoes untied, just kind of the tongue hanging out, and go with my basketball, you know, I'm just kind of coming in, and... And I, I walk into the room, and the family sees me, and they're my neighbors across the street. And I said, how you doing? And they're just weeping and crying, and I could see that, I assumed it was their father, was just laying there, just laying there dead. 
and they said, um, they said, Father, they're looking at me like, Father. <laughs> and, and I said, I'm not a father. I, I'm, a, I'm a pastor, you know, but I came here to do last rites. <laughs> they're like, okay. And so, so I just said, let's worship. Let's praise Jesus right now. I didn't know if they were saved or nothing. I knew two of my neighbors were. And I just said, let's just praise him. And so I believe that three believers that come together is more powerful than 10 unbelievers around. And so they could do whatever they want, but we were going to praise him. And so we just started singing just love songs to Jesus. And the song that we sing, I'm an old-time worship leader, so I knew all the old songs, you know. Jesus. And we just sang that song, Holy and Anointed One. And all of a sudden, I heard a voice in my spirit and said, declare the last rites over him. I said, what last rites? And he says, his last right is he has the right to live. And so I leaned over, and we're praising, and I, and I just leaned over, and I said, in the name of Jesus, I declare your last rites is the right to live. And I stepped back. All of the, like, his heart monitor just started beeping. Every G started going off. The nurses ran in. They said, what did you do? I'm like, nothing. And, and they're just like, what's going on? All of a sudden, his heartbeat started beating faster, faster. He opened his eyes. And he says, I'm thirsty. He drinks. Yeah, give Jesus a hand. And then, and, then, and then he gets up, looks at me, and he goes, who are you? I'm like, I'm Father Tony. You know? And so, but, but that began. It was it's in the midst of our praises. See, how many of you know he's enthroned? with our praise that when we praise him you literally set up a throne for him to come and sit and when the king comes and sits at the throne the kingdom of god is at hand and see so we establish the kingdom through our praise i could tell you story after story i i practiced this this revelation came i said i need to, i need to see if this really works and i started living this and i remember the last story and then I, was, I went to go get chips. I was in between meetings, and I just ran in because I didn't have time for lunch. And I was in this grocery store, and I was trying to figure out what flavor Pringles to get, right? Because I'm really spiritual. I was praying. You know, and I was just kind of singing in the spirit, you know, just in my heart. And this guy looks at me, and he's just staring at me, right? I'm, and I'm, kind of, I'm getting a little uncomfortable, right? I'm trying to be spiritual and pray to see which flavor the chips to get. And, and he just keeps staring at me, and he's getting closer and closer, Right? And I said, Jesus, if he touches me, can I punch him? In the name of Jesus, in your name, though. So he'll be at least holy. You know? It'll be a holy and anointed. You know? and, and he gets close to me. And I said, how you doing? He's like this. I'm like, how you doing? He goes, I'm cheating on my wife. I'm going to leave my family. I don't know why I'm telling you this. And I thought, I don't know why you're telling me either. <laughs> but apparently God is in the chip aisle. And he just starts weeping. And he says, can you help me? I said, probably not. <laughs> no, I did. I said, probably not. I said, I'm way too much on the road to help you with anything. But I have a friend who's a great, great counselor. I said, he could help you a hundred times. You know, I gave him his name. I called them, connected them to. See, what happens when we live a life of praise? Let this be written to a generation not yet created that they may praise him. Now let me close this. So the prison guard was about to kill himself. Because he wakes up and there's a door open. It's dark. He assumes that everyone's gone. Are you with me? And all of a sudden, he hears a voice. Don't kill yourself, for we're all here. Let me ask you a question. How did Apostle Paul know that he was about to kill himself and see him when this jailer was in the same room and didn't see anybody and he was about to kill himself? Because praise unlocks mysteries and revelation. I believe it was supernatural because after that, the verse says, the prison guard called for lights and the lights came in and he saw everyone there. And then he fell and he said, what must I do to be saved? He wasn't talking about a spiritual salvation. He was talking about a physical saving because under Roman law, if a jailer lost their guard, uh, prisoner, they were doomed to death, to execution. What do I do to be saved? And he says, believe in the Lord Jesus 
and you shall be saved. I'm telling you something. God is going to release a family revival here. Amen. He's after whole households. Rakesh, I'm telling you right now, there is a grace on evangelism with miracles, signs, and wonders that, that you guys have been going after you know, over the years. But there's a fresh wave coming, and there's a fresh wave of people that are going to come with the heart of, of an evangelist, so to speak. And you know what? You're going to see a harvest starting. And you know, you know what? I want, I want to just boldly declare that entire families are going to come to know Jesus. Entire families are going to come to know Jesus. Entire families are going to come to know Jesus. Your praise is powerful. The Lord speak, spoke to me about this in October. I was at a conference, and he said, Tony, entire, there's a family revival I'm releasing. An entire family. I said, I want to see it. For me, a word isn't just good enough. I have to see it. See, the word, the prophetic word should provoke you into greater intimacy with Jesus. And in that partnership between heaven and earth, you should see the manifestation of it. But it comes through intimacy. And so, long story short, an entire family gets saved that night. A lady gets uh, freed up from being, uh, she was demon-possessed. She was, she was actually started levitating in the, middle of the room. And people didn't know what to do. I went over there and just, you know, just told her to stop it, and it fell you know, and just took authority. She got free and delivered. There was another man who was bound by pornography, cheating on uh, his wife. You know, he got set free. He got saved. There was a young man who came to me and said, you know what, I don't want to go to hell. And I said, what are you talking to me? He said, I gave a blood sacrifice to Satan to give him my soul so our family would have money. And I said, the blood of Jesus is more powerful than any blood sacrifice any man could make. All you need to do is say yes to the name of Jesus and accept him as your personal Savior and Lord, and you shall be saved. He accepted Jesus. Peace came into him. He smiled for the first time in four years and then I found out after all that happened at the end of the meeting all these ones came together and came to me and said this is my husband this is my wife this is my son an entire household got saved I saw it it's gonna happen let's all stand together if I could get the worship team up here listen your praise is powerful I know this is probably too simple for some of you, but I'm just a simple man. Simplicity is the gospel. It's Jesus. We fix our eyes on him. And I just want us to praise for a moment. We're just going to praise. Him. We're going to worship the Lord. But as we worship, here's what I want you to do. The darkest space in your life right now, I want you to put yourself in the middle of it. And from that place, we're going to praise him. You're going to establish a throne for the king of glory to come and sit to see everything changed. But see, change doesn't happen circumstantially around you. Change begins in your own heart. He transforms us by the renewing of our mind. And it's from that place everything around us changes. We just need a different perspective. We have to start seeing from an elevated place. And watch, we're going to see miracles tonight. We're going to see things tonight. And so right now, let's just, let's just go into a time of worship.
someone with their hands up, just ask them if you could pray for them. Just bless them. Jesus, our healer, is here. The great physician. Jesus. Well, we take authority over every sickness. We take authority over every pain, every growth, every ailment, infirmity. In the name of Jesus, we say it is gone. We cancel that right now in Jesus' name. We cancel the assignment of the enemy over your body. In Jesus' name. Tinnitus, right now, the ringing in the ear stops right now. In Jesus' name. If you have tonight's ringing in the ear, just raise your hand. Who are you? Is there anybody ringing in the ear? Just okay, let's pray for a silent prayer. Lord, we thank you. We're just going to we just cancel that over you right now. In Jesus' name, Simon. In the name of Jesus. your body. Just, if you're feeling 80% or better, just lift your hand. If you're feeling 80% or better, just lift your hand. Just lift it high so we can see it. I don't even have my glasses on. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Can we give the Lord a hand? Thank you, Lord. He's, he's healing in this place right now. Is there anybody else? So, Lord, we thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We don't have time for testimonies or anything like that, but I'm sure that we'll take some when you, know, when, when you come to an end together and sharing testimonies. But I believe that there's many of you, even as you go home tonight, Lord's, te- Lord's touching you right now, and you're going to wake up healed. Arthritis, I feel like the, anyone with arthritis, God is touching you right now, the fire of God. So say, be loosed right now in the name of Jesus. Pastor, can we give the Lord a hand? Come on. How many of you are blessed tonight? Wow. (laughs) We have Tony here tomorrow. He's going to be ministering in the Sunday service. And on Monday night, we have George and Van over here. So if you have your friends, 
just tell them about it. Even people watching, I know so many people are watching. So Georgian's going to be here Monday night for a night of worship and joy and party and you know whatever we want to call it. It's going to be powerful. Man, how many of you love Georgian? You love him, yeah. So get early. It's going to be powerful with Georgian. And uh, the whole of next week, we are there every night. That's the last week. So what we're really doing is we want to hear testimonies of what's happened even the last four nights with your Tony. I know there'll be amazing testimonies. We want to hear that. Even tonight, I believe something's happened. I've been hearing our team saying they've been incredibly blessed, Tony, by you. your word, the ministry, your love, and everything. So I just feel that, you know, so if you want, and even people watching, if you've had a testimony in the last four nights with Tony, it's a great encouragement for us and for him and his ministry because he's first time coming to UK. Come on. How many of you love Tony and want him to come back? Yeah, amen. I'm just taking, I'm taking uh, the privilege to share it. Cindy Jacobs gave my word. When London opens up, Europe will open up. Man, that is a word for Tony. And I think that's, so the Europe's going to open up from today. Man. So that's, that's powerful. Also, Cheon is with us March 21st, 22nd, and on the, the Sunday service. That's two nights of revival and Sunday service. So he's here for three, three days with us. So even people excited about revival, hearing about revival. I mean, Tony was saying things are breaking out at Harvest Rock Church. So you know, let's get excited for what he's going to bring in over here. On April 4th, Rick Pino is here for a school night of uh, a school of worship. And uh, uh, I think the tickets are online. Uh, people have been giving amazing testimonies of what's happening in a school of worship. So if you are a worship leader or uh, anyone connected with worship, April the 4th, it's on his website. And uh, thank you so much. Uh, we have a whole team over here. Simon, do you want to you want to come and just pray and release uh, and as we close? Amen. Wow, well, praise God. You know, there's always a reward for those who seek Him. There is. And we'd be forced to think that you can press in for as long as you've pressed in and there not be a reward. And what a great word from Tony too, eh? Amen. It's the first of many visits, my friend. Lester's next. <laughs> Do you like traveling in the boot of a car? Sorry, the, the trunk of a car. <laughs> <laughs> so Father we do thank you and we ask you for rain in the time of rain <laughs> just messes up everything but you manifest yourself in our lives in such a way that we're utterly spoiled Jewish rabbi praying on the TV and he says the Lord bless you, the Lord keep you the Lord make his face shine upon you and give you his peace and my son said, Dad he's pinched our prayer <laughs> <laughs> let's raise up a generation that think that way and we declare may the Lord bless you face. 